Hey, crime fighters and true crime junkies. Happy Wednesday. This is Derek Judd, the Cowboy Criminologist. And of course, I'm hosting Cowboy Criminology. Uh, first off, I want to say thank you to all of you who uh, uh, liked my, my video with my, my announcement. Uh, it's very cool to, uh, to think that I might be getting accepted into uh, such a good law school. Uh, it's also a little scary to think that I'll be going back to school again, but, uh, you know, I've, uh, I've been worried about going back to school the last two times I've did it and I've been very successful at it. So, uh, but thank you for the, for the encouragement and for watching the videos today. We got something just a little bit different. And for those of you, first off wondering about the vest, it's too hot to wear the vest today. So, uh, short sleeve button down it is uh but we've got something a little different boeing is facing a lawsuit from a former employee and this former employee had been worked as a, a quality control specialist and it brought concerns about different types of aircraft or uh different issues about aircraft to boeing's attention and nothing was done about it and in fact according to uh this lawsuit he was treated very hostily by boeing kind of sounds like he was a police officer at a crooked police department the interesting thing about this is is the faa looked into his complaints now who knows how far back these go uh starting 10 years ago there was the whole thing with the 737 max which boeing produced and there have been uh, over the last, I don't know, six months or so, there's been an increased incident of stuff falling off aircraft or including doors just falling off of, of aircraft and everybody going, I don't know. And so he was trying to shine light on that. And he his uh, his whistleblower lawsuit, this lawsuit is basically saying that he was subject to a hostile work environment because he was making these safety issues known to Boeing and they didn't want to hear about it. Well, now he's been found, uh, he, he was found dead today in, uh, in a hotel parking lot. And when I saw this, <clears throat> I'm sorry, yesterday, and when I saw this video pop up yesterday, my, my first thought went, man, here we go with conspiracy theories because you have you have a government organization, the FAA, looking into a powerful company, which is Boeing. And then you have the one person in the lawsuit, because it's not a class action, it's one individual having to prove wrongdoing on the company's part, which according to his attorneys and uh, things I've read on online, seems like he seems to have kept pretty good records. Seems like that's that's highly plausible, plausible. Uh, the other interesting thing in this is you have somebody who is on the verge uh, or could potentially be on the verge of a huge payday from this, this lawsuit, from this action and actually make meaningful change within the corporation itself. And he commits suicide, which, according to the, his attorneys, is out of the blue, out of character. There were no, uh, there were no indications that he was going to commit suicide. And so, sure enough, I saw that yesterday morning when I woke up, and I was like, "Here we go. We're going to have conspiracy theorists coming out of the woodwork because we got everything for that we need for a John Grisham novel." But News Nation had a guest on. Who is a uh, who's with Jackson State University, and I'm gonna I'm gonna show you this video because he's actually he, he's actually right on. Uh, he he stops short of saying that it's a suicide, but he doesn't jump straight to murder, and he does a lot to quell the whole you know uh, shadow agency conspiracy. So let's go ahead and watch this video and, and I'll do my I'll do my usual walkthrough and then I'll tell you how I think this case can be enhanced uh, by the actions of the investigators on the ground. So let's go ahead and For take a look. For its part, the FAA listened and it did find at least some of those concerns were valid, but 
Boeing allegedly didn't listen. Barnett claimed that his lifelong employer not only didn't listen to him, it punished him. And so he devoted his retirement to an explosive lawsuit that now technically is moot because he's dead. Last week, Barnett was in Charleston, South Carolina for depositions in the case, but he missed an appointment on Saturday. Okay, a little sensitivity on the part of the reporter. Uh, yes, technically the lawsuit is moot because when you lose your complainant in a, in a case, if it's a civil case or a criminal case, you, you have no case, all right? Um, because the defendant has a right to face their accuser. If the accuser is no longer willing or able to testify, your, your case kind of goes out the window. Um, there's, not really, there's not really a whole lot of places for this to go after that. Uh, unless new evidence can come that supports his claim. And, and we'll talk about all that uh, here after the video. He was found dead inside his pickup truck at the Holiday Inn. The authorities say they found a silver handgun in his lap, finger on the trigger. There was also a note in the passenger seat, but they're not saying what was in that note. Not yet, anyway. His attorneys say that none of this makes any sense. They say there was no indication that he was in any danger of taking his own life and that they want a full investigation. For its part, Boeing simply says, we are saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing and our thoughts are with his family and friends. Uh, my thoughts can be summed up in one word, forensics. Did he kill himself or did someone kill him and make it look like he took his own life? Because forensics will tell you that story from beyond the grave. And that's why Joseph Scott Morgan is here. Okay. He's a <clears throat> Now, this, this reporter kind of falls victim to the same thing I talked about in, in a couple of videos, an over-reliance on forensics, okay? Now, granted, the inside of a vehicle is a very, very small, very well-contained crime scene, but that doesn't mean it can't be contaminated, and that doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to bear the, the type of fruit that you want. Now, a lot of people might think about uh, the gun being found in his hand with his finger on the trigger. Uh, the, the whole thing that if a gunshot is to the head, uh, the hand goes limp and is unable to, to hold on to the firearm. It, it does happen, but people have also been able to hang on to the firearm and inside a vehicle. Who knows what could have happened, but that's not necessarily an indication that uh, that this, uh, that this suicide has been, or that this was a murder that was staged to look like a suicide. Okay. Um, trajectory and, uh, <clears throat> trajectory of the wound and of course, uh, gunshot residue is going to be important, but even gunshot residue tests are not 100% conclusive. Um, that just tells you that they fired a gun. That doesn't mean that they fired that particular gun, one thing or another. And I'll, I'll deep dive into all, into all that and kind of tie everything up here when we're done watching the video. A certified death investigator, a forensic analyst, and a distinguished scholar of the stuff at Jacksonville State University. Okay, so Joe... Did you see the look on his face when she said a scholar of the stuff? I guess that's why you don't have to be licensed to be a Shoot journalist. Shoot yourself in the head, your hand, and the gunshot residue, and the blood spatter, and the trajectory, all that will tell the story, won't it? Yes. Yes, it will. And understand this, the people that investigate suicides, this primarily falls to the corner of the medical examiner. This is not necessarily a crime. So I find it interesting that the coroner has already stated that this is a self-inflicted gunshot, uh, unless the police can come up with okay. More so, uh, Mr. Morgan is 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 on is on the right track. Um, the fact that he he said that he found it interesting that he said that it was a self-inflicted gunshot wound. Uh, yeah, I, I kind of throw up some red flags about that because he, he's right. 
the medical examiner, coroner, medical pathologist, whatever, whatever you happen to have in your jurisdiction is ultimately responsible for investigating and determining whether cause of death. So was that homicide, suicide, or accidental is basically what that's going to come down to. And investigators, it's not their job to really classify it as homicide, suicide, or accidental. Their job is to gather the evidence to support any one of those. Okay. So um, I, I like this Joseph Scott Morgan. I think he does a great job kind of explaining what he's looking uh what everybody's looking at uh and we'll go ahead and we'll keep going evidence that this was in fact something that was done at another's hand and that's how we defined homicide death at the hands of another then they're probably going to go with the conclusions of the coroner right now the police are waiting on that final conclusion so there's a letter uh they said that was found in the seat mm -hmm. beside him and they're not releasing any details of that which i also find unusual because wouldn't you want to quell any of this internet frenzy by saying the letter was very clear help me understand as a death investigator are, is it is it frequent that there's a a letter written under duress a suicide letter written under duress and can you tell uh well let, let's back up just a second first off uh suicide notes uh typically are atypical uh i think people are surprised by that uh, you generally do not find a suicide note when people decide to take their life. They do it in, in a second uh, most of the time. Uh, we in the medical legal community investigate probably at a rate of two to three suicides for every homicide. Uh, suicides outpace homicides by that factor in this country. So we have a lot of experience at this. But one of the things they're going to be doing if this was a handwritten note is that they're going to have exemplars, and this is typical of what we do, to look and see how this compares to his handwriting. And as to whether or not there was stress involved in this, if it was something that he was forced to do, that's gonna have to take it up to a different level. Probably the FBI would get involved in that. So what about the, the, the hotel parking lot, the Holiday Inn, and then mm -hmm. the part that he's in a car in public? I, I'm trying to sort of place that amongst the norms of people who take their lives. Where does that fit in your, you know, spectrum? Uh, yeah, well, to be within a vehicle, uh, firstly, you know, most of the time when we think about suicides in cars, we think about uh, uh, carbon monoxide exposure. We have a lot of those. Yeah. But no, it is not atypical for someone to take their life in a car. First off, it's an isolated area. Uh, many times uh, uh, the victim will attempt to take their life in a car because they don't want to mess up the house. They don't want to mess up a location. That goes to almost a thoughtfulness on the part of these individuals. If this was a rental car, he could care less about the interior of the car. So the fact that he did it there is not surprising. It's also a fear many people have, I think, of not having their bodies found that he didn't go off into the woods to do this. I think one of the keys here though, uh, you know, when they talk about a, a self-inflicted gunshot wound, is there any evidence that he was shot through the glass? Is there any evidence that someone else could have been in the vehicle? The key here is going to be GSR. I think the deposition of the antimony, yep. antimony the barium and the lead on his hand when they do this testing. That's what I thought you were going to say. Not only that, but if the guy came from behind and shot him in, in the driver's seat, you know, seat, right. uh, that trajectory would, would be a different okay. angle, too. So, Thank you for watching. <clears throat> Go to NewsNationNow.com to find NewsNation on your television provider. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of NewsNation's fact-driven, unbiased coverage. All right. So I, I think... Um, I think Mr. Morgan is 100% correct. I think he's on the I think he's on the right track with with things. Um, him saying that GSR is going to be the key to this case, like I said, GSR it's it's circumstantial evidence, like I, I say in a lot of my videos, circumstantial evidence until you can make it direct evidence, all right? And just because he has GSR in his hands that do, that's not necessarily conclusive of anything. Um, the reporter kind of falls into the same trap that a lot of us do. 
here you have somebody who is potentially uh, is is potentially going to get paid millions from this company for his treatment for being a whistleblower, all of these things. The FAA has backed up his claims. But it's going to come down to the evidence, okay? And the evidence is only going to be as good as the people that collect it. And just like the reporter was trying to... She was doing a really good job trying to... Well, let me say this. Mr. Morgan was doing a great job trying to say how this is probably not a conspiracy. And the reporter was hinting at things that kind of ramped that up a little bit. Okay, so let's let's just take this piece by piece. So the first thing you have to realize is that every suicide should be in investigated like a homicide. And I'm going to go ahead and say apparent suicide, because until you do your investigation, you don't know. The most common crime scene staging that occurs is to make a homicide look like a suicide. And for that reason, you always want to make sure that you are that you're investigating it just like you would a homicide. Okay. So obviously you're going to want to take video. You're going to want to take pictures. You're also going to want to collect evidence. Now, if it was me and I was in charge of the investigation, I would want the forensics team coming in and I'd want them vacuuming the different seats, vacuuming the floorboards, picking up any trace materials of, dead skin, of hair, of fibers, anything that we could use to connect to the victim or somebody else, okay? Now, I think there's some confusion as to whether this was his personal vehicle, whether this was a rental vehicle. Uh, of course, that's going to make things a little more complicated. Um, if it's his vehicle and there's evidence that fingerprints were wiped down, that's going to be interesting. If it's a rental car, that's going to be a little harder to prove because you're going to have fingerprints from many different individuals, depending on how well the vehicle was detailed when it was returned. So that could potentially be a dead end, but that's the thing. You collect everything at a crime scene because you don't know what's garbage and you don't know what's evidence until you've had a chance to analyze it and put it in context of your investigation, right? Because then you're using your evidence to support your facts instead of twisting your facts to support your evidence. Huge difference, okay? So we move on. We've already discussed the, uh, the firearm uh, being found in his hand. Not necessarily a unique circumstance and not generally an indication that something... Uh, that something else took place other than a suicide. But let's talk about the firearm. Where did he get it? Is it an heirloom? Is it, uh, was it given to him? We need to kind of track the, uh, the progeny of this firearm to figure out where it came from. Okay. Because depending on where that came, where the firearm came from can tell us a lot about Mr. Barnett leading up to this. Okay, and we'll get to that here in just a second. The other thing, uh, depending on the year model of the vehicle, has anybody downloaded the information from the compute from the in-car computer? Most cars today have computers, and based on the f sophistication of the vehicle, the year of the vehicle, the trim level of the vehicle that computer might be able to give you significant information, like when the last time a door was shut and when the last time a door was open. If the vehicle can give you that information and the coroner can, can pinpoint a time of death with reasonable certainty, it's going to either enhance the investigation to say, yes, this was a suicide, or it's going to reshape the investigation to say, hey, we need to be looking at other avenues. Talk to the hotel staff. 
was were there any people reported just kind of hanging around looking like they were waiting for somebody or were there people at the hotel that looked like they didn't belong uh, can we establish a video timeline and with surveillance cameras in atms at traffic signals on buildings uh, on people's homes it's gotten easier to develop those video timelines and can we put his last known location before he arrived at the hotel to uh to a reasonable certainty can we can we retrace those steps and create that video timeline when was the last time we saw him go into the hotel when was the last time we saw him come out are these things consistent with suicide homicide or accidental death at this time oh well, we'll hang on to that for just a second sometimes i get these thoughts and you know i'm, I'm kind of i've got all these thoughts flying around in my head and sometimes i'm trying to get them out a lot quicker than i'm able to say them and they don't always line up chronologically okay but let's take a look at the note so uh mr morgan said something very interesting that notes are actually atypical in suicides and that has been has been my experience um a lot of a lot of times the the notes come in in forms of text messages emails things like that uh and it's it doesn't really mean anything in the context of getting the of getting the the message for the receiver but in context, when you find out that somebody's committed suicide, that message takes on a whole new, uh, a whole new thing. Was the note handwritten? Was it typed out? If it's handwritten, you know, she wanted to talk about, the reporter wanted to talk about handwriting being done under duress. And there are handwriting experts out there who with a reasonable degree of certainty can say whether somebody wrote a note under duress or stress. And they're going to have to look over thousands and thousands and thousands of samples of, of Mr. Barnett's handwriting before they're even able to render an opinion, let alone uh, come to what they think might be a definite conclusion. Okay. So, now, what if the notes type? Well, if the notes type, that takes us in a completely different, uh, takes us in a different direction. What computer did he use? What printer did he use? When did he use it? All of these things are going to come into effect. Did Mr. Barnett just have a, a really bad day during deposition and he felt like this wasn't going anywhere? Maybe. Um, we, we, we just don't know. But that information right there is going to be critical to understanding his state of mind and where this came from. Now, if we can determine that at his home, at any homes of his associates, his attorneys, uh, the hotel, there's no evidence of him using. Uh, him using a, a computer and printer combination to print this letter up, that is going to be very telling that this is probably something set up. Okay. Um, so that's going to be something interesting to look at. Uh, the other thing <clears throat> is trying to establish a chain of events that would support this. Now, depositions are very nerve wracking, especially when you're, you know, David fighting Goliath and you've got, uh, you know, you've got a Fortune 500 company, been in business for years and has, you know, a team of high priced attorneys to fight your case and can actually bankrupt you fighting this case. Um, those are things that can add up. Now, the attorneys, for John Barnett are are saying that the, that's absolutely not the case and that there were no indications of of suicide. And the last thought was that if suicide can't be confirmed, 
and homicide can't be confirmed. What they're going to want to do is they're going to want to have a specialist come in and they mentioned the FBI specifically. And I think the FBI is the only group that does what they call equivocal death analysis or psychological autopsy. And what, what that is with equivocal death analysis or psychological autopsy, you're actually going back in time over the last six months to two years of a person's life. And you're looking at every aspect of their life, their relationships, their work life, their financial status, their credit, their travels, um, looking at their mental health, their physical health. All of these things come together, all right? Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create the most accurate picture of this person in life from their death, okay? And equivocal death analysis looks at, two th at, at three aspects, suicide, homicide, or accidental. Being that this individual was a, uh, Mr. Barnett was a quality control inspector for Boeing, I would find it very difficult to believe that he was playing with a firearm in his vehicle and it accidentally went off and the whole thing was unintentional. Um, People who have those occupations tend to be very safety minded, very safety conscious. So because of that, it's very unlikely that <clears throat> this was just accidental gunplay in his vehicle that got out of control. Um, those kind of things typically don't happen with somebody like this. Okay. Is that to say that that couldn't be the case? No, absolutely not. But probably unlikely. And homicide. So basically, if you rule out that it's an accidental death and you rule out suicide because of evidence you find, now your investigation goes to looking at this, uh, at, as this death, at this death as a homicide. And where this can take the investigation, who only knows? <clears throat> now, of course, it's real easy to sit there and say, well, Somebody knew he was going to get a payout, so they tried to they tried to rob him. They tried to extort him one thing or another. He didn't comply. He was killed. Well, generally, those things only if they do happen, and that's pretty rare, usually only happen after somebody has the money in hand. So in the deposition phase of a case, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, as far as a shadow conspiracy involving levels of government, people trying to protect Boeing, one thing or another. When you have coincidences in a, in a death like this, it's very easy to, to reach for the conspiracy theories, especially because of the bombardment of television and movies where this is a this is the prime setup for any one of those okay so you just got to kind of take it uh you just kind of have to keep in mind that you can't just jump to conclusions about what you think happened okay until you are familiar with the evidence until you're familiar with the person until you've conducted an investigation you can't really say so I would tend to call this, instead of saying it's a suicide or, or anything like that, I would say apparent suicide under suspicious circumstances. Because of the litigation that he was part of, it seems very suspect unless something just went horrifically wrong in his life that we don't know about. It seems unlikely that somebody would kill themselves under these conditions. but. We don't know. We don't know. So, y'all, I hope you enjoyed this video. Please like, subscribe, and share to your, uh, to your favorite social media. I appreciate those of you who, who share my videos with others. And if you're one of those folks who, uh, who likes to view these videos and not subscribe, you know, I'd appreciate it if you subscribe or at least comment on the, on the videos and let me know what you think. 
Y'all, I'm Derek Judd with Cowboy Criminology. Y'all have a safe weekend.